Greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is the Gateway Project, episode number 11, where we are supposed to bring up the Canadarm. It is a robotic arm that goes on the outside of the real ISS. I have my own KSS version, and I gotta tell you, I am super excited so far because I'm halfway done making this episode, and I haven't had any gremlins in the works yet at all all. Right here we have ourselves one of the two new satellites that I'm putting up so that I can go and investigate anomalies around Minmus. So we're going to need some remote tech connections and I'm taking this first satellite and we're going to send this one over to Minmus right here right along this path and it's going to go intercept over there. You can see him coming in pretty close. Once uh, we have this one on its way I will then launch a second satellite and it will be the relay. So we'll have one over at Minmus over here and another one back at Kerbin and they will communicate with each other and send the information back relaying it to mission control. So here we go, sending that thing out there. We have our intercept, and now we need to send the second satellite. This one is going to stay around Kerbin and will be its relay. Well, I guess technically when I say this one, I don't mean this one. Now, I don't consider this a gremlin. This is just me. I took a very shallow approach to going up and uh, Deadly Reentry was not happy with how low I was when I got going so fast. So I sent a third satellite. The other one crashed. But the third satellite, that one was the one that made it up. This satellite at Kerbin is going into a polar, what's called a Molnia orbit, which means it's going to go very high uh, above the North Pole and then very close at the South Pole. And just because it's polar at all, it's going to be in constant communication with Minmus right now. Right now, after we deploy this Kerbin satellite, we need to put up the Canadarm. And last episode, I said I was going to get to putting up a satellite where I build it in orbit. The reason why I want to make that one is it will allow us to keep an eye on the outside of the space station because spatial anomalies have been developing around the station as well. Here we are setting up the beginnings of our relay. This is the Philippides II, of course, named after Philippides Kerman, who ran 40 kilometers in the Battle of Maraton in between the two cities of Katins and Karta, just to declare that the evil empire of the Kersians had been defeated. Hmm, I'm watching myself do the deployment of this satellite, and I am reminded that uh, apparently the memory fades fast because there was a gremlin. I tried to set the lock on those infernal robotic servos so that I could force my solar panels to go out sideways, but they wouldn't lock, and so I was forced to have them be kind of diagonal. But I don't know, it, it's functioning. It looks pretty good, I think, still. Kind of looks like a little bird of some kind. I, I'm okay with it. Uh, it's not really a gremlin that I was re remembering. Getting back to the station, Bob is ready to go out and make another attempt at constructing a satellite in orbit. Now, I had actually done this just after I fixed my problems in the last episode, but I just sort of ran out of time in that episode in order to really show it. So we're going to show it in here. I have a variety of parts that I had previously brought up in that Hydra cargo carrier right here. There's three boxes of parts. That probe takes up the entire insides of one of the boxes. Unfortunately, the probe kind of sinks into Bob Kerman's back here when he tries to pick it up. So every time he releases it, it just kind of flies away. But look at this. This is awesome. I didn't even know you could do that. Look at that. You can attach pick up the, the probe and then attach a solar panel to it. Uh, but again, because it's sunk into his back and I couldn't figure out how to fix that little thing, it kept popping off every time I would either drop it or uh, pick up a new part while it was held. So I just stuck it over on the side of the, the ship right here. In fact, ultimately I decided that the right answer was to take all the parts out of the back uh, of the crates stick them to the side of the ship one by one and then craft everything. So that's what Bob is doing right here. He's grabbing everything one by one, putting it to the side. And then when he's got them all out, the probe will be constructed with some monopropellant and some RCS engines, a few batteries, a couple 
uh, flat solar panels, uh, an antenna, of course, to connect it to remote tech. I have a camera that's going to go on it, which will allow it to train its little beady eye over toward the space station and watch for anomalies so we can get a good view of it. This is actually not terribly unlike something that happened in the real ISS. Uh, there was a mission around the same time where they brought up a little satellite and they put the satellite up and uh, it went off into its own little orbit. And it wasn't looking for spatial anomalies, of course, or anything like that. Another thing that happened actually around that same time was they did a crew transfer. The very first crew swapped out with crew number two and I didn't actually do that in mine because uh, if I had swapped out the crew every single time the real space station had swapped out their crew, I'd be spending every episode doing some sort of swap because uh, it's going to start coming a lot faster as these missions go on and on. But I am going to swap out the crew this episode just because this is the one when the candid arm is supposed to come up. And you know who brought the candid arm up? It was Chris Hadfield. And who doesn't know Chris Hadfield, right? First Canadian spacewalker. The guy's a rock star. Yeah, he and Scott Parazinski were installing the Canada Arm together. So when my crew transfer happens here, you may see some somewhat familiar names, I'm thinking. Bob has almost completed the construction of his satellite. He just needs to put that monopropellant tank on there and uh, perhaps forget that he's supposed to put the monopropellant tank on there. And if that's okay, it hadn't gotten very far away because it can't really move without it. So yeah, it wasn't going anywhere. So he gets down here and he plops that monopropellant on there. And then uh, whenever you attach something in the Kerbal attachment system, you have to do a quick reload if it's any kind of real functional part like solar panels or anything like that sometimes. So I do a quick reload right there, save and reload to get it activated. And uh, then we kind of take a look around, see what we can see. Ah, there's the station seen from the eye of the little satellite. So by now, the satellites that are going to provide the relay to our actual scientific satellite are well on their way. So it's time to launch the one that's going to do the analysis of Minmus and actually do that investigation of those anomalies. This is the Patrocles. The Patrocles, of course, named after the famous explorer Patrocles Kerman. And there goes the fairing, exposing our wonderful little scientific experiments that we have rebuilt and repaired from the damage they may have sustained during that attack. So now we set our satellite to point back at our communication satellites and extend those those antenna right there. Those are uh, actually special antenna that are going to help us analyze the anomalies. There is an additional antenna right here on the end for actual communication with the uh, local network. Oh, excellent. And now we have finally Hadfield Kerman and Parazinski Kerman. Perhaps thinking about Patrocles, the great explorer, who was not just a great explorer, but also a great general. As you know, of course, he defended the city of Cabalonia against Demetrius Kerman simply by flooding the irrigation canals. Or perhaps they're just thinking about snacks, because after all, it's really Jebediah who's the history buff. I think Hadfield here, he just likes snacks. So I hadn't noticed it at the time, but this cargo hold on the transport that's bringing up the crew to go attach that robotic arm, I was supposed to put the uh, second ORU in there, the one that's supposed to go on the side of the Destiny module. It is a, uh, let's see, what is it called? I wrote it down here. A direct current switching unit. Uh, some kind of battery thing. I don't know. It helps manage the DC electricity on the station that goes from the P6 truss down. Oh, I don't know. They wave their hands around a lot and they say, magic happens, and then electricity comes. Anyway, I had forgotten to put that thing in the bottom of this capsule, so I guess I'm going to have to do that in the next episode rather than this one. It's a little out of sync, but uh, eh, well, well. So here we are once again, moving the crew around. They're floating their way through the station using the uh, tr crew transfer, whatever that thing is called. It's a manifest, crew manifest, the special mod that I absolutely love because I don't have to EVA everybody constantly. 
And then the old crew has hopped on board the previous vessel. So they switch those out on the real ISS. They switch those out every six months. So when the new one comes up, uh, it docks on, and then the old crew hops in the other one, and they go back again in that. You, of course, don't want to leave those up there for too long because you always want to have a nice, ready-to-go, safe escape capsule just in case something goes wrong, you know, like uh, the movie Gravity where something's hitting the ISS and they're like, everybody out now, and so they have to hop in their escape capsules and head in every which way direction and come back like our, our cr old crew is doing right here. And look at the gorgeous place where they're coming down. Oh, the nice mountains, the lush grass. I'll bet they're going to hop out of that capsule and go, oh, I missed the world so much. And just roll around in the ground. That's assuming that they have the muscles. Oh, look at that. He's got the muscles to do it. He's just fine. After all that time up there, they must have some special exercise equipment. So now it's time to launch the robotic arm itself. Hmm, yeah. So attempt number one, not so good. Uh, usually after a failure like that, what I like to do is just stage it off to make sure that at least all the rest of the staging was right. And then as it was falling down here, I think, hmm, I wonder if there's a chance that I could actually recover some of this, at least a little bit of it. You know, any one engine that gets saved can be reused again on the next craft. Of course we're going to reuse it. We don't use fresh stuff every time. What are you thinking? Sadly, this one doesn't quite make it. Oh well. Alright, so we're going to launch a second version of the arm. The first one, obviously, was completely destroyed. This one has a couple extra gyroscopes at the top. Gigantic gyroscopes that are definitely holding it in place. It is going straight as an arrow. Except for the fact that I underestimated the amount of fuel I was going to need in order to put that up into orbit, I ran out way earlier because those are very heavy gyroscopes. Oh well, okay, so we're going to lose this one too. But I wonder if I can save this, the last one I wasn't able to save. If we can save this robotic arm, then we won't get in trouble with the budgetary body that manages our budgets. And look at that. We ran out of fuel a little bit above the ground, but we managed to come down. So is it still in operating order? Let's take a look. We'll pop the fairing. So far, so good. Let's manipulate some of those controls. Yep, those are working. Working our way down through all the controls one by one. Make sure everything is still in working order. And if it is, we're gonna take this robotic arm back and launch it again. Okay, this time we have a bigger rocket, more fuel. Of course, that just throws it off balance. All right, this isn't so funny anymore. And again, I don't think I'm going to count this as gremlins. Uh, this is just, you know, I need to do a better job. Now here, no connection. Oh well, we've gone out of sight, so this one was lost. I think what it needs is a bigger bottom rocket. Uh, we're trying to put it up on a really narrow one, and if we just have a, a wider base, maybe that's going to get us up there. So let's give that one a try. So far, so good. Drop the first stage. It looks like we're on track actually this time. And so there at our apoapsis, sure enough, we're going to make it this time. We'll circularize and make our inclination change at the same time, thereby saving fuel. And here it goes. And notice those fairings as they fall off. Look at that apoapsis and periapsis. Uh oh, we were up at 70. That is a couple more pieces of orbital debris, and Bob, not Bob, Bill, still hasn't found out about that other piece of orbital debris, but as soon as he does, he's probably going to find out now there's three. Oh well. So, here we are. We have our docking node junior. This is where the arm needs to go. So the arm is just sitting a little ways off, maybe, a, I don't know, 100 meters, 200 meters off the side of the station waiting for Bob here to put that node in place. And while he's here uh, doing his EVA, he might as well put the antenna that needs to go on the destiny module. This will help us stay in control of that robotic arm and be able to communicate with the ground. 
So our injection stage is no longer needed. It's time to take the arm over to the station on its little monopropellant and RCS engines. However, look up in the right corner. Notice my monopropellant. I didn't notice the monopropellant while I was coming in. If I had, maybe I wouldn't have been wasting quite as much as I was. But here we go, point two, point one, and gone. But fear not. Bob Kerman is a master engineer. He knows just what to do. He's going to get out there and chase down that arm and hop in the command seat that the engineers were smart enough to put in place. And look at that. That is one happy Kerbal right there. And he remembers that this injection stage had monopropellant in it. So he calls over to the KSS and he relays the instructions in, telling the injection stage to come back so that he can get out, go over there, and grab some monopropellant from inside that upper stage. It's a good thing we hadn't deorbited this already. By getting one of those monopropellant little uh, spheres from inside there and going over and attaching it to the arm, he'll be able to provide an additional supply of mono to those little ro rockets there, those little RCS engines. And that will get this arm back to the station. He's sure of it. And there's no worries about the fact that he's just stuck this extra thing on the side of it because there's a bunch of stuff on the side of it. There's some uh, some batteries and some solar panels and now the mono thing and the RCS engines and an antenna and all of that is intended to be taken off once this thing is in place. All of it is removable, grabbable. Oh, there he is, that happy Kerbal, he's coming up. It's all removable so he can take it all off and bring it over to some crate, put it in a crate and eventually just have it deorbited at some point in the future. So here we go. This arm is going to slide into place. We're watching our monopropellant. We have 12 units left. It's had nine units left. Just easing our way in, turning the RCS on and off again, only at those moments when we know we need it, and then just using the internal gyros for the rest of the time to do our rotations instead of using the mono for our rotations. And there it is. We have docked it. Victory! Ha <laughs> ha! Now we just need to go and take those bits off and pack them up so that they can be deorbited at some point in the future. Speaking of deorbiting, Bill gets out of his anger management classes next week, and we're going to have to come up with something, I think, to get that orbital debris because I don't know how long we're going to be able to keep him in the dark, not knowing that we have the three pieces up here now, just floating around, breaking his personal rule. I'm pretty sure that Engineer Jebediah will have a few ideas, maybe. No doubt they will include robotics, as they so often do with Jebediah's designs. So with all this trash getting cleaned off, now we can just go put a light on the end of it there, put away this last battery, and then give the arm a try. Ah, uh, there we go. Extend it out. Bend the elbows, spin the servos. It's looking like it's in pretty good shape. Okay, I have no idea what we're going to use the arm to do, but anyway, so now we don't need that injection stage for the arm anymore. We can actually finally get rid of that and go deorbit that. Watching the playback of moments like this is what Bill lives for. He just sits in his room and he turns these things on and he stares at them for hours and he plays them again and again and again. I think there's something wrong with that guy. Okay, so in the next episode we're going to do the ORU number two. We're going to intercept Minmus. We are going to dissect the satellites that we sent out. Bill comes out of anger management. We do the quest airlock, install some oxygen tanks on that, do a repair on the ammonia cooling system, and maybe try to track down Joseph. Until next time, Kerbinauts, I'll 